Welcome to everybody, uh, I think we can say this now, around the world, which is very exciting <laughs> for us, um, to the latest in the uh, Morecambe Bay Sunset series of talks. Um, tonight, uh, Dr. Bill Shannon is talking to us about uh, pen and ink, um, and we'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, before I hand over to Bill, I'll just say a little bit, uh, particularly for those for whom this might be the first time about the context uh, of these talks. So um, we at um, Morecambe Bay Partnership, we're a, we're a small charity, um, really looking after, celebrating, engaging people with everything that's great about Morecambe Bay, um, which is the bay between uh, sort of Lancashire in the south and Cumbria in the north. Um, so dealing with uh, natural history, cultural heritage, um, uh, public access, um, economic regeneration, community engagement, those sorts of things. And obviously during the COVID period, while we've been in lockdown, a lot of our um, normal engagement events and activities uh, haven't been able to go ahead face to face. So uh, the, the team at Morecambe Bay Partnership conceived of the idea of doing an evening of, uh, sorry, a series of evening talks. Um, and the sunset series is just a reference to the most amazing sunsets that we get as we look west across the bay from, from where we all live um, over to Ireland and obviously with North America in the very, very far distance as well. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the next one uh, when we finish. Um, uh, so um, before, um, before Bill starts, I'll just say a little bit about him. So Dr. Bill Shannon is uh, one of our trustees. Uh, myself, I'm Tom, I'm the chair of Morecambe Bay Partnership and we've got a couple of staff on the line, we have Susanna, who is the chief executive, and Claire, who's the heritage officer, also with us helping and this Michelle. evening. Michelle. Is Michelle there as well? Okay. Yep. Hi, Michelle, as well. Um, so, <laughs> the uh, so so Bill is a, a notable uh, local historian and antiquary, um, and particularly since he's retired, has developed a sort of sideline in um, uh, in research and academia. Um, got a close <laughs> connection with the University of Lancaster. Um, and Bill uh, is going to say a little bit more about this, but he is he's inspired uh, by a 17th century antiquary in whose footsteps um, he is uh, sort of treading. Uh, and he has spent a lot of time uh, researching and writing about um, Richard Cureden, um, who is uh, a man who really documented a lot of what we know about um, early uh, writing in this country from medieval onwards mm -hmm. um, and in particular Bill is going to be talking about uh, the, the practical side of, of how the old techniques uh, worked in terms of making the quills from from goose feathers of which obviously Morecambe Bay is uh, internationally renowned um, for our uh, our wading birds uh, and wildfowl uh, and then with ink from oak ghouls uh, techniques which uh, yeah well we're going to find out why they vanished I guess and uh, and and what how they worked and why they were so special so Bill um, over to you um, we will do questions at the end um, but like we've been doing with all these sessions um, anybody who wants to raise a question by on the chat function um, we will be looking through all those questions and we will be putting them to Bill once you finish talking great so thank you very much Bill uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I, in case you're wondering what this is, uh, this is a rush light. I was talking about these last week, that these were the normal um, home lighting. People tended around the, the bay and into Cumbria not to use um, candles, uh, but to use rush, dip rushes. And you can see from this that it, uh, it, it's a pretty good light and it will burn and you can see how long it's taking. Uh, the, one dipped rush like this will take about two hours to burn down. I am going to blow it out because I'm a little bit worried if while I'm, my attention is elsewhere to have a flame like that, th that near to my hair is probably not a good idea. So I'm gonna blow it out and put it out of the way. <laughs> I have brought um, uh, a pen and uh, ink in case I need to make notes as we go on. The, the important thing now is to, for me to share the screen, and I'm hoping that this will work. <laughs> okay, I, can, uh, can somebody, Susanna or Tom, just give a thumbs up if that looks okay? 
good. Fine. Well, these are oak galls. They're also known as marble galls or oak apples. These particular ones were growing on a, an oak sapling in Old Park Wood in Holker, which is where I spent quite a lot of my time. But for over a thousand years, through the Middle Ages and through the early modern period, Clark scribe scholars made their own ink using galls like these, and I'll explain more shortly. And of course, everybody knows Shakespeare wrote with a feather. Our very word pen comes from the Anglo-Norman word penna, which is from Latin penna, a feather. And I'm sure you all know that the French for a feather is la plume, which, uh, which obviously means a feather, and the German word for a feather is de feather. So everybody writes with feathers. And those of you who are on Twitter, will probably be aware that the icon that they use when you want to write something is, yes, a feather. Now, as a historian, I spend a lot of time looking at old documents. Some of them are beautiful. This is the great coucher book of the Duchy of Lancaster, um, just over 600, 600 years old. Yeah, it's beautifully written. It's beautifully illuminated, as you can see. You can see the way the gold is shining off the page here. Absolutely beautiful. And the, the writing is, it's all written using oak gall ink. Most of the time though, I'm not looking at beautiful documents like that. I'm looking at not beautiful documents that look like this. These are workaday documents. They're often meant only for the writer's eyes. They're full of blots and crossings out. They're often written on poor quality paper using poor quality ink and poor quality pens. This is a page from the manuscript notes of Richard Cureden, um, who Tom's referred to, the 17th century Lancashire antiquary, whose biography I've recently written. Here's a plug for that book published by the Cheatham Society. But it was while reading Cureden's notes, as here in the archives of the College of Heralds in London, that I began to think about the way he was using pen and ink. Here's his signature, and it's in a brown ink, but you can see the letters immediately above it are in a sort of grey ink. I mean, it's a, sort of what's going on here? Why, why is some of his inks faded, some of them brown, some of them black? And notice too, on this page of notes of his written about the um, Greek geographer Ptolemy dating from about 150 AD um, and Curden's copying out uh, Ptolemy's notes and notice the way as he starts writing the ink fades away until he dips his pen in again he's dipped his pen in there and it's faded away and then he's dipped his pen in there so it's darker when it's just written and then it, it fades away. So dark, fade away, dip, dipped in, fade away, dipped in again, dipped in, fade away and so on. Uh, and, and so, I mean, this is something that you, you, you're conscious here that he's not using very high quality ink. There's a lot of blots, uh, it's, it's messy and so on and so forth. But just before we leave this page, those of you who are from the area around the bay, can I just draw your attention to what he's actually writing about? He's translating Ptolemy's notes about the, the inlets, the estuaries, etc., up our coast. So he's got here Satia, Belisama estuarium, Sitantiorum portus, and Morikambi estuarium. And Cureden has, has tried to translate what these are. So Satia, he's dipped his pen in and he's written Chester and Liverpool water, Belisama estuarium, He's dipped his pen in again, Ribble or Preston water, and then Setantiorum Portus, Lancaster water with Peel Haven in Furness. And he hasn't attempted to guess where Morikambi, where Morecambe is. He hasn't put any indication of that. Anyway, that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is looking through his document at the way that he's writing. And I was particularly, got particularly interested in cured and through his surveying and mapping work. This is some of his archive in the Lancashire archives and it comprises road maps of Lancashire, town plans of Lancaster and Preston and a fairly detailed survey of the Cartmel Peninsula. Here for example is his survey of the town of, of town village whatever you like to call it of Flukeborough in 1685 
For those of you who know it will know that it's a long straight street from uh, Sandgate here. This is Main Street, going down to where the car park and the chippy is there and on down Market Street that way. And it hasn't changed a great deal. Kewarden would have recognized most of those buildings and that's what he, he, he's planning. But it's not, as I say, it's not the content that I'm gonna be talking about today as much as the way he's using ink and paper and, and pens and so on. And you can see this page, this is from a part of his survey of Preston. You can see it's a working document. You can see the blots and, the, the, uh, and that sort of thing. But you can also see on these documents, these strange things, little parallel lines or fancy letters. So what's going on here? And the answer is what are known as pen trials. When you're using a quill, you need to keep sharpening it. And every time you do, you need to test it out, either by drawing some fine parallel lines like this, like that, like that, or by writing some big flashy letters to make sure that it will do what you want it to do, that you've cut it properly. And it's not just Kewarden who is at it. Many documents you, you will find in books, this is an auditor's book of 1577, where the author has used the flyleaf for pen trials. And you can see again, he, he's done similarly, similarly, he's used parallel lines, he's used his own name, Thomas Morris, and he's written that over and over again. But you can also see that he's, he's been messing around with two different types of nibs here, the normal fine nib, but also a spade cut nib, which is used for, if you like, a medieval style of writing. And here's another example from the early 17th century, an entry book of warrants where the owner, Robert Treswell, has used, every time he's, he's sharpened his nib, he's done lots of fancy swash letter R's for his initial. Now, if you look at contemporary illustrations of scribes, you'll see that they have a pen in one hand and something else in the other hand. And that something else is being used, generally speaking, to press down and hold the parchment in place whilst writing. Before we move on past this, perhaps you just got notice a couple of things. He's got slots in his desk for spare pens. He's got slots in his desk for inkhorns, which is his inkwell. And the desk itself is at a, on a slope. Medieval scribes tended to write on a slope, not on the flat. But I want to come back to this thing that he's holding in that hand. And here's a couple more showing what it was, its main use for, was, which of course was to recut the nib. It is a pen knife, hence the name. For obvious reasons, this is why we all carry, or we all used to carry pen knives with us to sharpen our pens. So the chap on the right, on the left rather, is sharpening his, his pen, and the chap on the right is having a look at the nib to make sure he's holding it up to the light to see how well it's been cut. And his next step would be to do a few pen trials. Now you might notice incidentally that none of these pens have barbs left on. It was normal to remove the barbs and just leave the shaft or quill, but it doesn't look so good on the telly. So in TV plays and on films, you always see writers using the full feather. Anyway, let's proceed to make a quill pen. Now, most people in the past use goose feathers. You could use swan and crow is sometimes used for fine work. Now, note the way the feathers curve away to the left or right in the two wings. And it's much better to use one that curves away from your body. So for a right-handed person, you use the top one. The first thing you have to do is harden the feathers. You have to harden this end, the, the working end of the feather. And the way you do that is by plunging them into hot sand and leaving them to cool. So you heat the sand until the surface of it is hot enough for water dropped on its surface to sizzle, to spit, to boil. Um, you plunge in the, the, the feathers as far as, as the hollow part of the stem uh, carries, and then you leave them for as long as it takes to cool down to room temperature. And once hardened, the barbs are stripped back, and then you need to cut the nib using your pen knife. And this takes two basic cuts. The first cut is a long shallow cut. And the second one is a steep cut. And it's that 
combination of those two cuts that forms the traditional pen shaped end. And you then make a split in the nib and then you either cut it, spade, cut it across the edge um, for italic style or you sharpen it to a fine point for mapping work, drawing and the like. Now, it is said by Christopher de Hamel, who should know, that during the course of a day, a busy scribe would sharpen his pen up to 60 times. Now, that means that you're probably sharpening your pen, resharpening your pen every 10 minutes or so. And from an account that we have of the uh, clerks in the Exchequer, a branch of government in 1807, they were issued with three quills a day. So somebody who is writing all day, every day, 12 hours a day, you get through three quills. Now, most people would buy a dozen quills at a time. Most ordinary people, that would last you a long time. But if you're a professional writer, you get through quills quite rapidly. Now, before we get on to ink, let's just have a quick thought about what they're writing on. And in the Middle Age, that basically was parchment, which is made from untanned skins of cattle or sheep soaked in lime wash. Then the hair is scraped away. Uh, with the, the whole thing stretched on a frame to, to stretch it and dry it. This uh, frame here, you can see that half of the uh, hair has been scraped away to show you the, the effect. Um, I saw this last year in the Lancashire Archives in an exhibition there. And if you're only going to write on one side of the parchment, you'd probably write on the other side, the, the, the flesh side. Now, the best quality parchment was made from calf skins that it was known as vellum from the late Latin word for a calf. It's the same word that gives us veal. But from the 16th century, paper began to be more common. Uh, usually imported, we don't really have a paper industry in this country well into the 17th century. But if you look at this, this is part of the town plan of Lancaster. Uh, instead of looking at the lines on it, look through them at the watermark and with a bit of luck you might be able to pick out a crown and a sort of shield and in the middle of the shield there is a fleur-de-lis. You can see the three feathers of the fleur-de-lis and that paper, that paper, that watermark of the crown with the fleur-de-lis tells you that this is imported Dutch paper and it tells you that it's a larger size than the normal size of paper. That was a special watermark for that. This, which is, again, this is from part of the roadmap of the Grange to Holker. And on here, we've got a, a, a nice watermark here. This is a jester. You can see him looking this way. He's got a big nose. He's wearing a collar with bells on it. And he's wearing a hat, again, with bells on it. Now, the jester was also known as a, a fool. And the hat he's wearing at was known as a cap. This, is, this watermark was known as fool's cap and it was used for a particular size of paper. And we went on calling that size of paper fool's cap until really it got taken over by A4 not that long ago. Now let's get on to ink. Now, because ink was so normal and every day, recipes for ink are extremely rare. This one dates from 1483. It's written in Middle English, the language of Chaucer. So it's not that easy to read. So I'll translate it rather than just read it out. To make ink, take gall and copperas or vitriol and gum, a quarter of each or half a quarter of each. Put them together in a pot and stir it often. And within two weeks, you'll be able to write with it. And if you use a quarter of each, then take a quart of water. And if you use half a quarter, then take half a quart of water. So it, it's not the clearest thing in the world, but by gall, he means oak galls, widely available locally, although the best quality ones were imported from the Mediterranean. By copperus, he means iron sulfate, which was also known as iron vitriol. Now, it could be made from iron pyrites, and that was available locally, as, as we saw uh, last week when we were talking about iron pyrites in terms of fire making. It was widely used in Cumbria. It was used in the manufacture of uh, uh, what was known as oil of vitriol or, or sulfuric acid. The third ingredient was gum, gum Arabic, which was imported from the Middle East. So let's start with the Gauls. Now, around about this time of the year, uh, they can be seen on certain oak trees, unripe and green, not to be confused with unripe and green acorns. 
the the gall is made by the tree as a defensive response to the actions of various species of gall wasp and different species lay their eggs on the twigs on the leaves on the buds of oak trees this one makes the best scores this is the marble gall wasp it's not a native to this country it was introduced into this country in the 18th century for the purpose of ink making now here's a gall i harvested too soon um, and inside is the larva of the wasp but by october the galls are ready to harvest the these little holes show where the larva has escaped and has moved on to become a wasp and to start the whole cycle again, laying their eggs next spring. Now here's a handful of harvested galls and essentially these are made almost entirely of tannin, which is a source of gallic acid, which oxidizes to tannic acid and that's what we use to make the ink. And we start off by crushing the galls as, as fine as we can and you then need to collect rainwater. Here's the water butt in my garden. The reason for that is you can't make ink with hard water. You can't make ink with lime, limey water. Now I use a pint of rainwater to two ounces of crushed galls. I add two thirds of that water to the galls, stir well and leave in a glass container to extract the tannic acid. Now, the amount of time you need to leave it uh, I, the last lot of ink I made, I left it a fortnight, uh, really to get the last bit of uh, tannic acid out of the galls. This is copperous iron sulfate. I'm going to use an ounce of that prior to dissolving it in rainwater. You can buy copperous in any garden center. It's used as a fertilizer for grass. So I weighed an ounce, added two thirds of the remaining water to it and dissolved it. And the third ingredient is gum arabic, and you can get that in any artist supply shop. And I weighed out half an ounce and I added the final bit of water. Now, the last lot I made, I used a bit more gum arabic. The, the, the point about the gum arabic is it, it makes the ink stickier. It makes it adhere better to the paper. So you now leave, need to leave the ingredients to stand. Different recipes give different lengths of time for the three ingredients to stand. And other recipes add, suggest you add other things. For example, you could add iron nails to that uh, bucket with the, um, the gauze. You could use vinegar or um, stale wine or stale beer or even urine instead of water. I have to say I haven't tried that latter recipe yet. And the recipes often contradict one another. Um, so I just use the basic recipe of gall copperous gum in a ratio of four to one with 10 times as much water as gall to make the, the ink. You now need to strain the crushed gall mix. I am using here an old pop sock of my wife's, but cheesecloth I think is usually recommended. Now, at this stage, litmus paper showed an, an, a, a pH, an acid level of about pH four going on towards three. It's about as acid as, as lemon juice. It's that sort of level of acidity. And let's just watch what happens when you now add the copperus to the tannic acid. This is tannic acid, oak gauze left soaking overnight in water and then strained. This is uh, copperus or iron sulfate. I add the iron sulfate to the tannic acid, which is a muddy brown color and a chemical reaction causes it to turn instantly black. This is ink. So I so say that's the, the chemical reaction that produces the black of the ink. And you now need to add the other ingredient. So again, let's just do that. The final stage is to add gum arabic, which thickens and helps to bind the ink to the paper. So that's the finished product, iron gall ink, which is chemically known as ferrous tannate. Um, and it's made by mixing tannic acid with copperous iron sulfate and with gum arabic. Now, it needs to be kept in a sealed bottle as it will oxidize if left exposed to air. And in fact, that's what happens when you write with it. When you first write with it, it tends to be um, quite gray 
but within seconds it starts to blacken up as it oxidizes from ferrous tannate to ferric tannate, which is darker, it's not soluble, and it's permanent. And that's the key point about this ink, it is permanent. And you can tell uh, Clark from his inky fingers. This is um, using some of that ink last year in the Learning for Life tent at the Westmoreland County show. Lots of primary school kids having great fun writing with a feather. I don't know why, but it was the girls in particular who were really queuing up. They really loved the idea of writing with a feather. And I'm always happy to talk to uh, school groups and try to enthuse, that, enthuse them with uh, ideas of history. Anyway, back to the ink. One of, one of his properties is once it's dry, it won't fade. And over time, it actually burns its way into the parchment or paper, parchment in particular. This is a paper map of 1581, and the ink here has actually eaten its way through the paper, leaving only the outline of what had been written. Now, I'm not sure why it had happened in this way. It hasn't happened with that writing there. And I think it may be something to do with the chemistry of the green color that the chap has used here. But another property of iron gall ink is it's permanent. It can't be erased. And the guy who di did this map must have known that it couldn't be erased. But when he made a mistake in sketching the village of Easingweld here, he, he certainly tried to rub it out. Um, he was doomed to fail. Had this been on parchment, he could have scraped it away. But you can't do that with paper. Now, let's just look briefly at how you wrote with a quill pen. Here's half a dozen images of monks and others writing with quills on parchment. All of them are using a pen knife um, to hold down and stretch the parchment whilst they're writing. Notice the slanted writing desks that we've already mentioned and notice things like the ink horn there that they're using for dipping in. But the thing I want you to look at particularly is how they're holding their pens. Without exception, they're holding the pen between the thumb and first two fingers stretched out while with the other fingers tucked below like this. Now this is quite different to the tripod method I was taught at school or the curved fist method which young people today seem to favour. Here's yet more scribes using that straight fingered hold coupled with the sloped writing desk. And the one on the bottom right, incidentally, here, he's actually writing on a, a wax tablet with a metal stylus, which was common in the Roman period. And of course, what this is showing is that this two, fing two fingers stretched out hold goes right back to the Roman period. Now, while we're talking about steel, you can't use steel nibs with oak gall. It's too acid. It, would, it rusts the steel nibs right away. They just rust too readily. And steel nibs only came in after we replaced oak gall ink with Indian ink, that, which was imported from India, made from lamp black, carbon black, in the late 18th century. And the steel nibs that some of us at least remember from school only really became popular from about the 1820s. But once you had both Indian ink and steel nibs, then oak gall ink and goose quills, uh, they were yesterday, they disappeared very rapidly. So to sum up, here's a little, another little video. I hope we've got the sound okay with this and here goes. In just a few days, we've turned a handful of oak galls into ink. Now remains to test out the ink using our quill pen made from a goose feather with the end cut using a pen knife, obviously and split to form the nib. Dip in the nib, wipe off the surplus and start writing.
<clears throat> a couple of things to observe. First of all, the paper that I'm it's the paper that I'm using here isn't really absorbent enough. Um, um, early paper tended to be a little bit more like blotting paper. And what you usually did though to absorb the blots was to shake pumice powder over the letter. And you often see that in, in films of people shaking the powder and then blowing it away. Notice too that the quill tends to blot when first put down on the paper. So a cursive style where you don't lift the pen from the paper is to be preferred. And the most common style from the early 16th well into the 17th, later 17th century was secretary hand, which I was partly trying to emulate in that video. Now let's have a look at another medieval scribe. His name, as you can see, is Hugo. He describes himself as Pictor, a painter, so Hugo the painter. And notice a few things. Notice his inkhorn here. He's got his pen dipped into it. Notice this is his penna. That's the thing you use to, to store the next three or four pens that you, you're using. Um, he he's got his pen knife and he, he, he probably would also have had a, a pounce pot somewhere with the pumice powder that he'd use both for preparing the parchment and also for drying the ink. But another thing that I'd like you to notice is the fact that he's left-handed. This is the only image I've ever found of a left-handed scribe. So how rare was that? In fact, I mean, I just don't know. Maybe it was as rare as green hair. Anyway, I've got a few minutes left. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit of light relief, another type of ink, which is invisible ink, which is basically just lemon juice used fresh. And the idea is you write your innocent letter in ink as usual. And I've written here, uh, this part of the letter is written plain so anyone can read it. You then write between the lines with lemon juice. You can see it here while it's still wet, but once it's dry, there's absolutely no trace. So you seal your letter and you send it off and your recipient knows what to expect. So has a candle ready. And as you hold the candle near the letter, brown words appear between the lines. So written between the lines, it reads, but this part is written in invisible ink for your secrets. Now, of course, this was much used in the 16th century by Jesuits, allegedly, and of course, Mary Queen of Scots, think about the Babington plot. And finally, here's one other writing material which makes its appearance in the mid 16th century and which is specially linked to Cumbria. This map was made by a Lancashire man called Lawrence Knoll in the 1560s. It was an attempt by him to map Anglo-Saxon England. Here's, the, here's Morecambe Bay, the Lancashire coast. If we have a close up look at Morecambe Bay, you can see the Peel of Foudre, that's Peel Castle. You can see Rampside, you can see Furness and Millam over there, all written in Anglo-Saxon script and with Anglo-Saxon spelling, even though none of them is actually Anglo-Saxon. But what I want you to look at is not the ink that's used for these names, but the grid and the layout lines, which are written in a shiny metallic looking material, which had only just been discovered in Borodale, where it was being used to mark sheep. It was known locally as wad. And when it came into general use, it was known as plumbago. And the reason it was called plumbago is because in the Middle Ages, scribes often laid out their illuminations using what was called metal point, sometimes silver, but usually lead, which was known as plummet from the Latin word that gives us the word plumber. And this new stuff, plumbago, was thought to be a variety of lead. The difference was plumbago laid a sort of gray sort of line, whereas this new black lead laid out a much blacker line. And here I, I've, I've just done some drawing with plummet and plumbago. You can see how very similar they are. The only way you could tell them apart would be by chemical analysis. But the black lead was much more convenient to use. And it wasn't long before it's being recommended for use. For example, this is a surveying textbook of 1590 where you've got here a piece of graphite in the end of this, what he's called a keeler, or another new word which has come in, a pencil. Now, prior to this, a pencil was a fine pointed paintbrush, but from here on in, a pencil tends to be a graphite uh, a, a writing tool. So my final slide, I'm just going to show you a map of the black lead mines in Cumberland. 
you can see here, possibly here's um, Don't Water. You go up down Borrowdale, there's the Boulder Stone, and down here towards Seathwaite. I'll just blow up this bit because here above Seathwaite are the black lead mines. Those mines in the 16th and 17th century produced the whole of the world's supply of graphite. So they came from this one small place, Seathwaite, at the end of Borrowdale, near Keswick. So there we have it, oak gall ink, goose quills, lemon juice and graphite, the story of writing. Thank you. I now stop sharing and I hope that is uh, okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can hear you okay, thank you Tom. Great, thank yeah. you very, very much. That was um, fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you could also hear my clapping. <laughs> I could see it, I couldn't hear it. Yeah, um, we've, got some we've got a bravo and some other comments coming through. So um, I'll start in a second with the questions. Um, bizarrely, and I'm not sure if you know this Bill, but yeah. I do actually, uh, I work in Borrowdale as my day job. Um, oh, right. <laughs> and I and I do know the wad mines. You do. And, oh, good. And there's yes. something amazing about being on a fell, surrounded by by sheep and small trees, and being able to pick up a rock. Yes. Ill it's actually illegal to pick them up, but if I, you I believe actually so. pick up a lump of graphite <laughs> and be able to write with it, just you know, on a piece of paper. Next it, time you do that, quite a good experience. You, next time you do that, will you pick up two bits of rock and save one for me, please? Okay, I've got one on my desk, actually. Uh, I'll, um, I'll rescue it for you. Um, good. Okay, so I will uh, start with loads and loads of comments on the chat, Bill. So I'll start with those ones and then uh, we'll open it up um, from, from the floor. So uh, lots and lots of uh, thank yous. So um, a question here, which has kind of been answered, but obviously not everyone will have access to the chat. So I'll I'll read it out. So Laura um, asks, will all oak trees have galls? I've been looking in seawood in Bardsey, but haven't mm. found any. Mm. The answer um, is by no means. Um, sometimes you can wander into an oak wood and every tree has oak galls on it. And then the next year you can go back to the same wood and can't find a single one. And um, I saw... I bumped into Simon Williams, who's over there, um, a, a few weeks ago when I was looking in, in Jack Scout. I didn't find a single oak gall in Jack Scout that day. Uh, so, no, I, I don't know why. Um, and I, th I think, I mean, this may be something to do with why in the 18th century they introduced that, uh, that uh, oak gall, the marble gall wasp, mm. to try and get some control over what was happening. Yeah. But no, mm. unfortunately, if, if you're lucky, you see them. Um, but no, by no means. Mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. And it's, it's interesting, I'm not sure whether this is Claire or whether this is Michelle, but um, Morecambe Bay Partnership uh, have answered, you can find them more often on the more stunted oaks. This and I have to true. Mm. And, I, and I have to say, one of the things which is a real feature of Morecambe Bay, obviously, is the limestone pavements that we have yes. on the slightly higher ground. And, yeah. and I've mm -hmm. certainly noticed that when you get those, like mm -hmm. in your picture, actually, when you get the very young oaks that are growing up uh, through the limestone pavement or on the limestone pavement, um, you do very, very often get the galls yes. and actually mm -hmm. at ground level as well. Yeah. That first image that I showed was very much a young sapling. It was, I doubt it was probably in its second year and it was absolutely um, full of the things. The following year, it was a year older. There wasn't a single one on it. It's now growing into a little oak tree. It's now about five years old and I've not seen any on it since, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're um, right, I mean, that was, that was growing on limestone and it was very yeah. much a stunted uh, tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got um, another question uh, about about walnuts, uh, oh, yes. and so, uh, someone. I'm seeing if I can find the comment now from mm. Andy. Mm. So he says, "I recently bought some walnut ink for yes. use in calligraphy. Yes. Um, can mm. you tell us anything about that?" I, 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 I only know that walnut is, is a very good stain. It's used in dyeing and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know uh, the, uh, the extent to which it was in widespread use. Um, 
uh, so I've not come across it across it in a, a medieval context. I, in a medieval context, the only two inks you you come across are oak gall ink and carbon black ink, um, right. and car, oak gall tends to be the more common. But I, you know, I, I, I'd be interested to see. Presumably, it's brown in colour, is it, rather than the, the that very black that mm. uh, you get with the iron gall. Um, great. Okay. So uh, another question yeah. here. Yes, we're just so, being told the walnut ink is indeed brown. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so would would all literate people have made their own ink in medieval times, or would people have bought and sold it? In which case, how expensive would it have been? I think um, the answer is. Uh, you know, if you're posh, you get somebody else to make your 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 ink for you. So I can't imagine Lord So and So would be make, making his own ink. But I mean, just as a for instance, um, um, Jane Austen's is it a sister-in-law or some relation writes about making ink for Jane. Um, you know, so she's making it with to her recipe, which is very very similar to my recipe, um, and is making it for a friend or for a, a relation. Um, Cureton is almost certainly making his own ink, but he's 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 buying his paper, and you can you can see he's buying his paper in batches. So there are certainly stationers' shops, and in fact, the the stationers' company in London um, has as its sort of heraldic crest, not crest, that's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. It's heraldic sign, a, a, a penner and um, ink horn, you know, so that the, you know, that the, the stationers started off make it commercially making pens and ink uh, and selling them. But I think most, uh, certainly the, the, the monks, the, 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 the clerks in the exchequer and the other officers of state, they were, they were um, uh, um, sorry, the monks would be making their own or you would perhaps get one monk who would be making them for everybody sort of thing. In the offices of state, you'd be buying it in, you'd be buying a dozen quills at a time, you'd be buying ink in and so on and so forth. But most ordinary people would be making their own ink, yeah. So a couple of follow-up questions uh, on <laughs> Gauls. So one of them is, um, so what would you have done uh, when Gaul was not available? Um, but, and you did mention that people, it was imported as well? Yes, it was. It was imported from the Mediterranean, um, Spain in particular, where they had, where the, the marble gall um, uh, wasp was native, endemic. So the, generally speaking, the best galls were imported. I was trying to think of somewhere else. Um, I, I remember reading somewhere about one of the monasteries off on Iona or one of the other places around there, where again, the merchant ships coming in were bringing vermilion and oak galls and you know all the things that you needed um you know to make your 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 manuscripts yeah um great and then another one so uh so barbara asks um can you save galls from one year to the next or do they need to be fresh uh, no, you can save galls indefinitely um, once the, they have ripened and the, the lava has left them. They are like, in effect, they're like wood. So as long as you keep them dry, they'll keep forever. Um, you can, just going back to the gentleman who was talking about buying uh, walnut, um, you can buy um, from craft dyers, craft dye shops will sell crushed gall um, as a dye stuff. Um, mm. So if you can't find your own source, um, then find a craft dyer who will be able to sell you an ounce or two of crushed gall. Yeah. And similarly, you mentioned uh, the ink uh, as lasting in effect forever when it's on the paper. Yeah. Um, did the ink have a sell by date when it was just in a bottle as long as it was airtight? As long as it's airtight. I mean, I, I, I did check earlier today, just the way you do. Um, uh, some ink that I made in August of 2018, I, I just wrote with it and it is perfectly fine. It's been kept in an airtight bottle for that amount of time. If you had it in an open um, jar, a jug or whatever, it rapidly deteriorates. Um, yeah, so now, I mean, they do say, you know, you do need to keep making your ink. You can't, 
you can't make a barrel of it sort of mm. thing you do need yeah. to make it in quite small quantities yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. Great. Uh, so, and then we got another question here from from mm. Pat. Mm. So we're moving from the uh, from the ink now to the the paper. Mm -hmm. um, Pat asks, uh, do you know anything about paper made from linen rags? And then says there was paper making at Cark. Mm. All the paper. Oh, so it's Pat Rowland then, I imagine. Yes. Yes, Pat. If Rowland, we're talking, yeah. hi, hi, Pat. Um, yeah, I mean, all the paper that I'm talking about is made from linen rags. So the wood pulp paper comes in later it's rubbish um it, it doesn't last you know you, if you go into the uh, you know the british library or whatever and compare a, a 200 year old linen type paper with a 50 year old wood pulp uh, paper it really is rubbish so yes you so you need rag paper i'm trying to think when the first commercial paper making in this country. I think it starts about the 1570s, that sort of date, but it's very, very rare. Um, well into the 17th century, we were still importing most of our paper from Holland, from the Low Countries. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I, I did know about the paper making at Cark, and the other place I'm thinking about is, um, oh God, Beetham, of course. Is it Beetham? Yeah, yeah, yeah Beetham, yeah. yeah. I was gonna, yeah. gonna yeah. say that, yeah. yeah. Which is the, uh, the great paper making place now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to see if I can switch to um, the video. Uh, another question has just come in on the chat, which I'll come back to. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you want to try and uh, catch uh, my attention, if anybody wants to ask a question, um, sort of in the flesh with your real voice rather than on the chat, I'm going to. Uh, look through uh, the the images, mm -hmm. and if anybody wants to kind of wave at me, I'll I'll I will come to you. I said this last time; it's a bit like being an auctioneer. So uh, I'll try not to pick on anyone who's just sort of scratching or waving at someone who's off screen. Um, let's have a quick look. Okay, I'll give it a couple of minutes, and then I'll come back to the chat. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't look like anyone's got a question uh, right. from there, so I'll, I'll come back to the chat now. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So Laura uh, mm. asks mm. again, um, can you use oak galls to make watercolour paint? Um, uh, I, I, I don't see any reason why not. Um, it wouldn't be the most exciting of paints because it would be black, basically. Um, yeah. but uh, I mean certainly you know you can see the, the the way you can spread it around on the paper from all the messy papers and it, it works it, it it dyes your hands you, the way you can tell a clerk is his inky fingers it is extremely difficult to remove once it's on your fingers but uh, it, it has to wear out but going back I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use a, a wash yeah. but you can't get shades of it it's either black or it's not yeah yeah I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, you, we've seen it in shades of grey and brown, etc. But you know, it, it's it's what it is. You yeah. can't sort of water it down and get a different sort of colour yeah. out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, oh. and, uh, Andy asks. Um, so mm. obviously, the well, the medieval techniques you're talking yeah. about went went quite late, and printing presses were introduced mm. before that. So was when when printing was introduced, mm -hmm. was was iron gall ink used in the printing process? Uh, the answer off the top of my head is I don't know, but I suspect not. I would have thought that the acidity of the the iron gall ink would be. Uh, definitely not what you would want associated with um, movable type. Um, mm. So I would have thought that they would use carbon black um, in, and of course it has to be a very sticky, um, I was going to say oily, but that's the wrong word, but you know, yeah. you, need a, you need a different sort of ink. So I yeah. would have thought that the black ink that they were using was carbon black, but somebody can correct me. I don't honestly yeah. know about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the next question actually was, uh, can you tell us anything more about medieval carbon black ink? Please. Yeah, the, um, the, I'm, I'm part of a group at the moment that's working on uh, the Goth map, of, which is a map of Britain made around about 1400, but it's based upon a map that had been made in about 1360 or so. When it's 
the map is first laid out in carbon blacking and then um, all the sort of overwriting is done in iron galling. Now, whether this was two different people, uh, whether it was um, you know, a week later or a fortnight or, a, or 10 years later is not, is not clear, but oak galling and, and carbon blacking were in use together at around about the same time. Carbon blacking goes back much earlier. It's used in the Roman period, um, whereas oak galling doesn't seem to be uh, used in. <laughs> Somebody's just telling me that that um, Gutenberg used ink that contained lamp black and linseed. Thank you. Yeah, so it was oily and carbon black. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've completely lost my thread by reading that. So, um, but yeah. What, so what we what we were saying is that uh, uh, carbon black ink is used through the medieval period, but it's it doesn't seem to be used for this sort of fine quality, the illuminated work, and and so on. So yeah. But then, of course, another form of carbon black comes in in uh, the late 18th century, coming in from India as as Indian ink, and then that completely yeah. takes over. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Okay. So I'm 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 trying to pull the questions. Uh, we we've got a couple of questions about about scribes. Oh yes. Um, and they were particularly interesting. Your um, yeah, your your images. Mm -hmm. So um question here so all the scribes you showed us were men were there any oh. reason why no women were scribes um this uh, this is um i don't know the, the 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 particular bias here but obviously nuns uh wrote i mean we we know of uh, a number of uh, you know hildegard of bingen and julian of norwich etc who who wrote um so um, but they weren't working in scriptoria the way the monks that we've been showing are. And I think possibly these, these are the scriptorium monks bigging themselves up anyway by putting in a portrait of themselves, sometimes even like Hugo, naming themselves uh, in their documents. So I think possibly it's a, it's a bias because of the very people who are doing effectively self-portraits or, or uh, illuminated manuscripts that, um, but yeah, educated women, uh, nuns and the right would be writing just as much as men. Yeah, they just didn't bang on about it all but the they time like the men did. About it. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so no change there. Yeah. No, no. Um, okay. And then follow. Yeah, n another question from Carla, and I, I don't know if Carla is herself left-handed, oh. um, but just just loving the uh, the, the left-handed monk. Um, yeah. yeah, and and I guess it's a similar question. So I, I I'm familiar. Um, I remember at school. I I'm mm. just just old enough mm. that we had to use pen and ink at school right. and anybody who, who was left-handed yes. had to develop the most <clears throat> sort of bizarre writing technique because yes. otherwise you're smudging yes. all the time yes and and <clears throat> so that the yeah. the unusualness of that left-handed monk is that because because of the similar problem well i mean i think i think that, i mean there is there's a, a thing about left-handedness the latin word is sinister for left, sinister, dexter, sinister, dexter. Um, and sinister has all these other associations. So, I mean, when my mother, who was born in 1919, when she was at uh, convent school in the 1920s, um, she was not allowed to write with her left hand. She was made to write with her right hand. Mm -hmm. Now, in adult life, she, as a trick, was able to sign her signature identically with two pens held in her left and her right hand at the same time. But, and I, I suspect that anybody going to a monastic school was made to write with their right hand, whether they were left-handed or not, and they just had wow. to learn. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and then, yeah, kind of similar, <laughs> uh, three, three cheers Thank for you, the Michelle. lefties. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, the James, sinister people. Yeah. Um, uh, James asks about the curvature of the quills. So a oh. similar thing. So given that you said mm, that mm, the mm, that most people are, are using mm. their, their right hand, does that yeah. mean that only one wing of the bird was valuable? No, I mean, this, as it happens, uh, this one that I was uh, playing around with before, it curves the wrong way. It, if it, it would be in, more inconvenient if it was uh, 
a bit bigger than this, but I can write quite happily with this, which is which curves that way. But ideally, I want one that curves that way. So I, I, I suspect that you, when you went down to the stationers and bought a, a dozen goose quills, you got six of each. Um, do, do you, uh, so you mentioned before about geese and swans and crows, kind mm, of the different mm. sizes of feathers being used for yeah, different yeah, mm, sort yeah. of techniques. Um, and mm. was, so one goose was as good as another, was it? Or um, were there any particular species? Um, I suspect, I mean, if you start thinking about by the 18th century, the huge, huge numbers of quills that were being used commercially and, you know, in yeah counting houses and everywhere else um they were pre they were predominantly pr uh, domestic geese by that sort of date right um yeah. so they'd be you know um my the geese my uh one of the best places to go is um on uh, windermere by diet by where the boats are you can always find some decent uh, quills there <laughs> yeah and um, but just on the subject of rate of um crow quills i there was a book came out last year by uh, he's, I'm trying to remember his name, he's the uh, um, archivist in Cheshire and he's writing about um, a, a guy who was working for a map making company and he, it's a diary and he talks about going along to the stationers and buying a dozen crow quills because he's using this for this fine work. Now, um, uh, it's, you're making too much noise for you. <laughs> sorry, they told his kids in the background. Yeah. So yeah, um, I haven't I haven't actually tried crow quills myself, but I think you'd go through the same process of hardening the end and then really, really um, sharpening them down to absolutely a fraction of a of a millimeter. Um, so I must have a go at that. Um, so we've we've uh, I, I don't know whether we've just touched on the defensiveness or the celebratoriness of uh, left-handed people but um, <laughs> we've got a few comments from left-handed people um, so just saying it that presumably it would be easier to write left-handed on sheaves of paper than it is in books where binding gets in the way no the the, the problem as uh, as I think you said you said before the problem is this ink is very wet it takes minutes um, sometimes longer than minutes for it to dry. You can, if your left hand, even with that two-fingered hold, your 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 two lower fingers are still dragging on the on the surface, and they're going to be smudging. Um, so I, I think it would be very difficult indeed to to write with iron gall ink with your left hand. Yeah, yeah, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's be impossible because there's always a way around these things. Yeah. Um, how far up the quill can be used? Um, oh. How far is it hollow? Um, this, uh, this is a swan quill that I've got here. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. So you can see from the, where the, the barbs, the barbs would start about there. And yeah. from the point where the, where the, the feathery bits go, it is no longer hollow. So it's the two inches or so below that that's that you can write with right okay so once you've sharpened your way up as far as where my fingers are now yeah it's no longer usable yeah wow okay so so when they're sharpening it it's a very tiny amount they're taking off it really time. is you're, you're yeah. shaving um and of course your your pen knife has to be more than razor sharp it has to be capable yeah. of you know yeah. really paring away uh at um i mean i I, I've always carried a pen knife ever since I was a lad, but um, I use a, a scalpel um, for making yeah, yeah. Uh, my my own pen knife. Uh, just it's very sharp, but it's not. It has to be razor sharp. You really have yeah. to be able to shave with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, one one question that uh, that I had actually. Um, <clears throat> which uh, there was something you said really made me laugh, um, which I, th I think I think you've come up with the definition. I hope I'm meant to make you laugh. 
Um, yeah, no, of what an experimental archaeologist is. Okay. Because the, the definition of experimental archaeologist I learned tonight is someone who hasn't used their urine yet. <laughs> and the, the addition of the word yet really made me laugh, which implies that at some point in the not too distant future, you are going to be giving that a go. Um, but that, that, uh, that leads me on to my, my main question. So how yes. did you learn how to do this? Um, well, how do you learn anything uh, on uh, to do with uh, experimental archaeology? There are three ways. Um, one is uh, by uh, researching, by looking in books, and there is very little. The second one is by the other method of researching, which is YouTube. Um, and uh, <laughs> you can find, um, I mean, the, the, the talk I was giving the other day about fire, YouTube is absolutely full of American um, survivalist people who will talk about making friction fire and so on and so forth. Mm. There are far fewer people um, on YouTube making ink. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the, the breakthrough was finding that, that particular thing in the, in the National Archives, that mm. recipe, um, yeah. and uh, finding um, the comment that uh, the recipe that um, Jane Austen's uh, relation used and that sort of thing so mm. and then it, it, trying it I mean the first yeah uh, you know I, I, I've just been making another lot at the moment and I'm, I've, I've added some um, half a glass of um, stale muscadet um, to see how that will improve the acidity <laughs> um, this is a stage on the road towards the stage yeah. that you mentioned before yeah but I've also put some wire wool steel wool in to see whether how that will um, affect yeah. it so so some of this is you know experimental stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and that kind of linked on I guess to, to the other obvious question is <laughs> it, it's not immediately an obvious thing to do is it to take the gall of an oak tree uh, that's been produced by a wasp and crush it up and add it to chemicals from different parts of the world to make a substance that writes. So do we have any idea how people, people learn to do that in the first place? It, it, these, it, all of these things are just so mind boggling. The fact that somebody came up with this, the fact that you find this thing. Now, all, all you can say really is that it's in, related to um, uh, possibly people had, no, I, don't, I, I was trying to think about the tannin, getting the tannin from the bark as, as part of that tanning process. Um, but you've still got to do this thing. You've got to, you've got to mix your oak galls with iron sulfide, uh, iron sulfate, with copperus. Neither of them are obvious things. <laughs> But then the other thing that isn't obvious by any stretch of the imagination, I was, I was thinking about this, thinking about, um, you know, pyrites and, uh, and, and going from pyrites to copperus to um, sulfuric acid. Um, and the enormous strides that were made through the Middle Ages in the chemists that call themselves alchemists in, in trying to understand these substances and the the, the, the nature of these substances and what they could do. Now, okay, they got 98% of it wrong, but that didn't matter. They were still experimenting the whole time with these substances. And I think of that, you know, the, the, um, the uh, uh, gunpowder, another sort of classic example, you mix um, charcoal with sulfur, with um, some stuff that you scrape off the walls of stables that's made from horse urine you know it's not an obvious thing to do is it no no we got, got um, some follow-up questions actually uh yeah. or, or so so james says what well, given that soaking acorns was a way to remove tannin in order to make acorn flour yes. perhaps galls were recognized as a more concentrated source of yes. tannin i mean that makes yeah. a lot of sense I, I think that that certainly does make a lot of sense yes yes yeah. yes yeah. yes yeah um okay uh i've got but you've uh, still got, got to, you've still got to make the step of turning that that tannic acid into that ferric, the, uh, you've got to add the iron one way or another because it's the iron that gives it that black and the permanence and the insolubility and so on and so forth. So, yeah, 
No, can't imagine who invented it. Yeah. No. Um, okay, so uh, we'll have a couple more. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've been tending to finish these at about quarter past mm -hmm. eight. So we'll just okay. do uh, probably these last two questions on okay. the chat, and then I'll do one last check to see if anyone's got any questions um, that they want to speak out loud, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, finish there. So final two points. Um, <laughs> You've mentioned today a lot about um, uh, kind of monks and what have you, um, and and formal writing. Do you know anything about the great composers, um, mm. Beethoven, Bach, etc.? Uh, were they using quills uh, and Indian ink, uh, and just commenting that it was a very fiddly way, presumably, to write a musical score? Um, I, I mean, again, it's it's entirely going to be dependent upon the date, but any composer writing before essentially before the 1820s is likely mm -hmm. to have been using a quill yeah. uh, the a steel nib doesn't come into the 1820s um any anybody certainly before about the 1780s would be using iron gall ink now from the 1780s oak, um, indian ink becomes more freely available um but i would have thought so so certainly any 18th century composer is using iron gall ink and and uh mm -hmm. And it really is going to be messy, isn't it? I mean, drawing out your, uh, can you imagine having this sort of inspiration and then trying to dip in your pen and get the notes in and all the rest of it? No, it, yeah. yeah, doesn't yeah. bear thinking of that. Mm. No, and then just a couple of final comments uh, <laughs> and then I'll, um, as I say, I'll, I'll come around the, uh, the video. Uh, so just a, a comment really, just I'm curious about the word stationer. I've ah. just read that the term comes from booksellers whose shops were in fixed places, e.g. near oh. universities, oh, okay. uh, as opposed to itinerant traders. So, um, that, um, that, is, that is very interesting. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever asked myself why they're called stationers, but that seems to make sense. Um, so I'm trying to think uh, what other word might have been used for... The, pe the people who were selling pens and paper and ink. Um, mm. And I can't think of one, no, but uh, no. no, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just, I mean, uh, obviously this is the fourth mm. one we've had so many comments, just in, we're not really questions, but just in terms of uh, how interesting it was, how thought provoking. Um, there's one here from, from Pat again, um, <laughs> just saying that I will be looking at old documents more closely in future. Um, <coughs> and then other people just saying mm. that the, the stuff around watermarks and mm. where the word full scap comes from and things like that is really, really fascinating. It's quite mind blowing. It kind of totally makes you look at, yeah, um, not just kind of what is written, but the way that it's written and, you know, all those kind of things underneath it, the, the, the mm -hmm. mechanics of writing it is absolutely fascinating. So mm -hmm. thank you very, very much. Um, so, can I just say something about yeah. watermarks? I mean, I, I, um, the, the archive people wouldn't like me to say this, but really every time you look at an old piece of paper, you should surreptitiously just hold it up a little towards the light and see if you can see a watermark because you learn so much about it. My man Curden, I could tell when he finished one batch of work and started another from the fact that the watermarks changed between his different working uh, yeah, and yeah. so on. So you can learn an awful lot. Yeah. Anyway, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. No, no, no. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, so just check that no one's trying to wave at me. Um, now we've got some more more thank yous coming in. Uh, fascinating hour, intriguing, interesting. So let's get. Yeah, I can see you've you've lit your candle. I have Is my it, rush your, light. Yeah, my rush light. light. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, it looks like you're kind of re ready to go to bed. Maybe get your <laughs> nightcap on, Bill, and then. Uh, <laughs> Yes. No, it's it's lovely. It's very Dickensian in your uh, your study. <laughs> um, so. Thank you very much, Bill, uh, for another really fascinating hour. I can see you've got lots and lots of new fans. Um, and thank you very much to everybody for joining. And hopefully we'll see you on another one of these soon.